And um, Clementine, if we've got everything ready to call it to order. Yes, would you like us to do the countdown for AMP? Yeah, if you'll do the countdown for AMP, appreciate that. Sure, Hype, are you all set? Oh, here comes the mayor. Hey everybody, I just walked in the door. queued up so you can take it for there and mayor we're ready for the pledge okay uh well recording then in progress <laughs> uh, clementine would you uh show us the flag on colton hall as usual please scared the wrong thing sorry hang on one second please no worries many windows open. Here we go. There we are. So I would invite everyone to join me in the pledge, please. All right, pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, the to the flag, flag of the United of States, States of America, States of America. and to the Republic, to the Republic for which, which it stands, stands. One nation, one nation. Undergo. Indivisible, indivisible with liberty, with liberty and justice, justice for, all. for all. Thank you. And so we certainly want to give a warm welcome to everyone who's joined us today for an interesting discussion on topic. Uh, Vice uh, Mayor Ed, did Clementine have an opportunity to read um, the uh, introduction of how people can participate in our meeting? Uh, no, that would be the next thing to do. Next thing to do. All right, so we will ask our courteous city clerk to do that for us, please. Yes, there are two ways to virtually participate in today's meeting. You may join us using the Zoom app on your computer or mobile device, and you can also call in to the Zoom meeting. To join the meeting on Zoom on your computer, smartphone, or telephone, use the link or phone number on the agenda at isearchmonterey.org. To call in by telephone, dial toll-free 833-568-8864, then enter meeting ID 161-384-4440, pound. And if prompted to enter a participant ID, press pound. Detailed instructions on using Zoom are available at monterey.org slash public meetings. To make a public comment using the Zoom app, you can virtually raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. If you've dialed in by phone, raise your hand by dialing star nine and then unmute yourself when called upon by dialing star six. You must do both. Public commenters will be muted until it is their turn to speak. I will call on each public speaker in the order of their hands raised. Please stay within the time limit established for today's meeting. A countdown timer will be shown on the screen. If you're connected live on Zoom, the timer is accurate with no delay. Today's meeting is also streamed live on the city's YouTube account at youtube.com slash city of Monterey with about 10 seconds delay and on Comcast channel 25 up to 90 seconds delay. And we look forward to receiving your public comments. As always, very nicely done. Then uh, would you do one more thing for us, please, and introduce the city council unless you did that already? Not yet. Councilmember Albert. All right, Albert. Let's, let's do that. Councilmember Albert. He was here. Lost him. Lost him. Well, I'll call on him again at the end. Councilmember Hoffa. <laughs> here. Councilmember Smith. Here. Councilmember Williamson. Here. Uh, Council and Mayor Roberson. Yes, I am here as well. And I do not see uh, Councilmember Albert at the moment. Hopefully, he will be joining us again at any time. Yeah. I, uh, Councilmember Albert has a, a computer problem right now uh, and he has to reboot, so he will be coming soon. Okay, good. Thank you for that update. The, the joys of Zoom meetings, lots of advantages, but I haven't been to one yet. There wasn't a snafu of some sort, but there, there's our new normal as uh, we keep defining what our new normal is going to be. Oh, so without further ado, while Councilmember Dan is getting ready to join us, we'll, I'm just going to turn it directly over to our very efficient city manager, Hans Uslar, and most likely he's going to do one of his famous punts and send it to uh, 
<laughs> are encouraging community development directors. So no, I won't do that. Uh, oh, <laughs> okay. uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council. Um, today, uh, today we will talk about the rental registry. Um, we we got the task from you uh, last year on September 29th. Uh, as part of a study session that we held at that time and we presented at that, uh, and there's council member Albert has joined us. Uh, at that time, we presented to you, the council, um, a lot of uh, legal background with respect to rent stabilization measures. And one of the elements that we also introduced to you uh, was the possibility of the creation of a rental registry. Uh, at that time, uh, uh, council asked us to uh, ask staff, task staff, to come back with very specific uh, answers to questions that you raised with respect to rental registries. Uh, and today is, is, is uh, basically the spe a special council meeting where we want to deliver those answers to your questions. Um, I really hope that after reading our agenda report, that um, you and the community also have gained uh, a better understanding uh, of the process and of the data that we need to collect in order to create a rental registry program. Uh, I hope you will also learn today or understand today what it takes also to maintain this database, uh, which basically in essence, every single day uh, will get uh, new data points because people are uh, renting new uh, new apartments or new properties and other people are, are leaving. So there is a constant app and flow of, of data that will go into the rental uh, registry. Um, I uh, emphasize that for you also a rental registry will be a significant new program addition to our housing office and it will require uh, considerable investment in personnel and resources. Um, so with that, uh, I, um, I, I think we have uh, a good presentation for you prepared that will highlight uh, the, the key points, the key, the key takeaways from our research that we conducted over the past five months. And um, I, with that, I lead it over to our uh, housing analyst, uh, Grant Leonard, and just skipping the community development director, not because the mayor was uh, saying I would hand it over to her, but just because we already uh, agreed to give it directly to uh, Grant. So with that, I uh, ask Grant to um, present the agenda report and the presentation. Thank you, Ron. Thank, Thank you. you uh, mayor and council, let me share my screen. Okay, how is that? Grant, I think we're, we're actually seeing the wrong screen. We're seeing the one that has the notes. Okay. How's that? That's perfect. Perfect. So, uh, yes, as we all know, tonight is uh, February 23rd, special study session for the council. Uh, to discuss rental registries. As Hans indicated in his introduction, uh, this was first discussed September 29th, and uh, we're returning tonight with answers to the specific questions that were requested of us. By way of background, uh, Monterey is a majority renter city. About 65% of the residents are renters, and approximately half of the housing units within the city of Monterey are multifamily. So apartments, duplexes, and up. Uh, we are an old city. 87% uh, of the city's housing stocks were built before 1990. Uh, that's important, particularly for uh, rent control measures, which affect properties that were constructed before 1995. So that's why that's an important data point. And as we all know, housing in Monterey is expensive, including rental housing. Uh, here you can see a snapshot of Zillow from earlier in the week. A uh, one bedroom apartment can easily go for $2,000 a month. Uh, two bedrooms can go up to almost $3,000 a month. So it's a very pricey uh, market to be a renter in. 
We went over the legal background in considerable detail in September, but just as a brief reminder, uh, Costa Hawkins is the principal act that restricts rent control in California to properties before 1995. Um, primarily multifamily units, so apartments, things like single family homes and uh, are exempt. The Ellis Act came after that, provided additional restrictions on rent control and allowed landlords to have the right to evict tenants if they take the property off the market. And in 2019, AB 1482 was passed, which is the Tenant Protection Act. And that restricts annual rent increase on certain rental properties not properties built within the last 15 years, uh, but older properties, multifamily units, uh, not single family homes if they're, and not duplexes if part of the property is owned by, uh, or is lived in by the owner. Uh, that act also provides certain eviction protections and um, related to just cause eviction and no fault eviction. It also, uh, the annual rent increase for that is 5% annually plus the local CPI or 10%, whichever is lower. A rental registry is typically used in conjunction with rent control measures. So cities that have rent control like Berkeley or San Francisco, you would see a rental registry. Rental registries can, however, include all rental units within the city. They're not restricted to rent controlled units. So single family homes, condominiums that are rented, duplexes, uh, even potentially room rentals could be included in a rental registry. Rental registry is used to gather data on the rental units and the tenancy trend. Common uh, data points that are gathered are the address, the owner of the property, how many units are at that address, lease date start, how long the lease is, uh, what the unit is being rented for, the rental rate, and if the tenant lease is not renewed or if there's an eviction, you can gather an explanation for that as well. Here are 16 cities within the state of California that have rental registries. As you see, they're larger cities, more urban cities uh, in the Bay Area, Los Angeles, Sacramento. Um, but then recently, as in last month, the city of Salinas has moved forward with a rental registry program and they are on schedule to pass a rental registry ordinance next month in March. And we'll discuss their program more at the end of this presentation. In terms of Monterey and the rental units uh, within the city, um, we spent a lot of time trying to determine how many units there are. And uh, the simple truth is it's impossible to know how many rental units are in the city at the moment because of uh, there's no database for how many rooms are being rented, how many apartments are currently being rented, condos that have been converted to rental, single family homes that are being rented. Uh, that data simply doesn't exist at this point. Uh, and that really is what we would learn from a rental registry when uh, every potentially every rental unit was registered and that data was collected. However, we do have an estimate of how many multifamily units are within the city. And we gathered that from our own city data from the building department and our GIS department, as well as county assessors data and title company data. From that, uh, it's estimated there are just over 6,000 units of multifamily uh, apartments within the city between 1,048 complexes, so 1,048 addresses that have those units divided between them. From the title company, um, we learned that there are 652 owners of those properties, and 542 are individuals, while 110 are corporations. So individuals may be a mom and pop who have an apartment complex and are using it for retirement, or it could be uh, a small business simply owned by an individual. And this council had requested a breakdown of how many studios, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom units there are. And that data also is not available. Uh, when a property is constructed, it's uh, coded by its zoning, multifamily, and a range of units are included. So there's no specific count of how many studios, for instance, are in the city of Monterey. 
Again, that would be data that could be gathered from a rental registry though. Grant, can I ask you a question before you move on? Just, it's a really quick question. Uh, of those 6,000 units, how many of those units are act, are on the, the military bases, which would be La Mesa or the DLI? Is, does that count into the 65 that we have on all the, all the peninsula? Or is it just um, uh, units outside of those uh, military bases? You know, that's an excellent question. Um, I believe it is outside the military, but I would have to confirm that. Okay, if you can sometime, I'd like I know the answer to that. Thank you, sorry for the interruption. No, excellent question. Uh, while discussing uh, the rental registry and rent control in September, we also discussed business licenses and whether adding questions to the business license program could gather additional data on rental units. Uh, for the city of Monterey, if your property is renting more than 10 units, uh, you would be required to have a business license. And in 2021, there were 48 business licenses issued for rental units. And those included a count of 1,330 units. So this was revenue to the city in the amount of 112,000. Um, from our GIS data, however, our city data, we determined there are 49 additional complexes with 10 or more units that did not have business licenses in 2021. So the city will need to conduct outreach to those owners about licensing requirements and see the current status of those properties if they're still being used for rental purposes. Uh, they may need to come to the city and, and receive their business license. In total, 97 complexes would qualify for business license with uh, just under 3,000 units. Uh, the big takeaway here though is that's less than half of the multifamily units in the city. So even adding questions to business license um, would not give a, a full data set for rental units here. You just have a partial insight into the rental industry. Uh, to establish a rental registry, it would be a significant undertaking for the city. It would be a new program for the housing office. As indicated in the staff report, uh, it's estimated two staff members would be needed for this program, administrative aid and a coordinator. New software would be needed. Uh, we did receive an initial quote for what that software would be. It's from a company that provides rental registry software throughout the nation and to a number of cities in the state of California. Uh, we'd need to confirm the number of multifamily units in the city really to begin estimating a budget for how much revenue potentially would come in. You have to identify how many potential units there would be. And so the number of multifamily units would be a good starting point. Um, but at this point, there's not no physically confirmed data. Uh, we just have what's on file from the title company, the building office, and the county. So really to verify that we'd have to go out and physically confirm the number of apartments at each address and there'd be new administrative costs there'd be new legal fees there'd be vehicle charges there'd be office supplies software costs licensing etc and it's likely that there would be need for additional landlord tenant services as um, more tenants look into the registry program they may have increased reporting to the city of potential fair housing issues or landlord tenant disputes that would need to be mediated. And then finally, if the registry was established, uh, it would have to be monitored for compliance. Uh, so one of the reasons you'd need those additional staff members is to make sure people who are required to register their rental unit actually are. And that would be an ongoing monitoring effort to ensure the success of the program. So a preliminary budget, uh, just based off the rough numbers we have now, to verify the apartments and rentals within the city could be up to $100,000 in time and effort. Rental registry software, the initial quote was $25,000 in setup costs. So uh, just between those two items, a startup cost of $125,000. The annual registration fee for the software is $30,000. Staff 
staff costs for additional staff plus percentage of management time to oversee those staff would be $300,000 for salaries and benefits. The administrative costs for computers, vehicles, licensing, legal services, supplies, uh, just approximately $60,000. And landlord tenant services in additional 10,000. Currently, we provide a CDBG community development block grant grant to Echo Fair Housing to provide landlord tenant services. And that's approximately 10,000 annually. Uh, so this would be doubling that, adding an additional $10,000 in landlord tenant services for a total of $400,000 in annual operating costs. Now, for financing a registry, it's typically done through a fee. So it's a self-sustaining program. I wouldn't draw from a general fund. It varies by city. Some cities have a flat rate of, say, $100 or $150 per unit. Others use a sliding scale, depending on how many units are being registered at a given address. The city of Salinas is looking into a sliding scale. Fee may be passed on to tenants. So there's um, all likelihood that that fee, when the, the landlord processes it or the property management company pays the city, that that'll then be passed on into the monthly rent for the tenant. Uh, looking down um, at the budget table below, as I mentioned, we can get a rough estimate of what our fee would be by dividing our budget by the number of units that could be in a registry. So just based on the multifamily units that we know are within the city of 6,010 units, uh, 400,000 divided by that would be a charge of $66.55 per unit, so per apartment or per rental. And that would cover the financing for the new registry program. Primary effects of the registry, um, I think it's key to know that this is not a rent stabilization tool. It's not rent control. It's not mandating um, certain links and leases. Uh, what it is, is it's a get data gathering tool. It increases transparency into the market. Rental market is a private market now, with little local oversight. Um, it is state oversight through laws like the Ellis Act and the Tenant Protection Act, but we don't have the local data into the market. A registry would have the potential to improve reporting of uh, maintenance issues at rental properties. Again, if tenants know their property is part of the registry, they could feel more confident coming to the city to report potential issues at the property. So there's a chance it would improve uh, the overall quality of the housing stock within the city. But it would be an additional regulatory requirement for landlords and property management companies. That would be an additional um, you know, login every year to register that rental unit and then to provide uh, whatever information was requested, uh, lease terms, rental rate, et cetera. So a time and uh, time impact to the property managers. And then of course the fee, which we talked about, would be a new fee that would likely be passed on to a tenant uh, unless the landlord chose to eat that and uh, pay it themselves. And then philosophically, this would be an involvement of the city into what's currently a private market. Uh, so adding that additional level of government regulation into, um, again, what's now just the private rental market. So uh, just a simple table to consider pros, cons, and policy considerations. Uh, this would provide new housing data, uh, could have the potential to increase reporting of problems at rental properties and thereby improve the maintenance and the quality of the housing stock. By gathering that data, it would have more transparency into the rental market. Um, and it would be an opportunity to inform future policy decisions. As you gather that data, you get the insights into the rental market, and the city could um, design future policies based off that data. However, it is limited in its utility. It really is just a database. It's not having a direct impact on people's monthly rents in the way that a rent stabilization or rent control would. It is a new fee and a new regulatory requirement. 
And it would be require significant city resources, including the $120,000 in startup costs. So for policy considerations, um, you know, is this the time uh, to create a new city program? Is this the type of program the city wants to pursue? Uh, how does it compare to other housing priorities, such as developing new affordable housing within the city, uh, serving the homeless community, et cetera? And um, back to the philosophical question, is this where the city should be involved? Should the city get involved in the private rental market? And then as you gather that data and you have the ability to inform future decisions, it would likely lead to consideration of future rent stabilization measures that we see in the other 16 cities that have uh, rental registries. So this is a major effort and it should require considerable public outreach if the city were to go forward with it. The registry would affect the 65% of our residents who are renters plus the percentage of the community that owns the properties and works in the property management industry. So really the city, in order to respect our community, would need to do outreach to renters, property owners, management companies. We do have a, a good recent model on a comprehensive outreach campaign from our cannabis ordinance outreach effort. And that's something we could certainly build off of for this effort. Now, the city of Salinas, as I mentioned, they passed, will be passing an ordinance next month for a rental registration program that was approved by city council in concept last month in January. But they started their discussion in 2018, so four years ago. And they formed a housing policy committee to look at it, at the potential for a registry plus other housing policies. And interestingly, uh, City of Salinas' main benefit for this is through code enforcement and public safety. Uh, they believe firmly that a rental registry will increase reporting of problem properties and therefore make it easier for code enforcement to go out and enforce city ordinances and improve, improve the quality of the housing stock and therefore the safety of the community. So their approach is not so much for rent stabilization or rent control, but for code enforcement and public safety. So just to wrap it up again, uh, registry would be significant new program. It would require new staff, new startup costs, but it could be paid for ongoing by its own registration fee. Uh, it would require considerable public engagement to see if this is the direction our community wants to go. It would result in new regulatory requirements and fees for the landlords. But a benefit is that you'd receive that rental data, uh, data about the rental market, and potential for improved uh, housing stock through maintenance of rental units. And it would, if the city were to pursue additional rent stabilization measures, the rental registry would be a good first step to gathering that data and setting up future stabilization measures for success. And with that, we can take council questions, comments, and then to the public. Uh, Grant, thank you. Uh... The, the whole housing department, community development department for a very engaging and thorough, thorough report. <clears throat> uh, this would be a point where we would have questions and we'll go out to the public. If I may, I'd like to start off with a question or two. The cities that have adopted this rental registry, do they do a, a minimum number of units that a landlord owns or would it be every rental unit in a city. Uh, it is that is up to the discretion of the city. Uh, so you could do a phased approach, say units over ten, or apartment complexes more than ten units, or you could have it for all units within the city. Uh, South City of San Francisco originally had a registry to support its rent control program, and in the last few years they've expanded that to all properties within the city. So not just properties before 1995 that are covered by rent control but now all rentals within the city. So they've made the decision to expand the registry. So it really is at the discretion of the city how, how you want to structure it. Yeah, so I <clears throat> probably it's all, it's probably all over the map with respect to, yeah, okay. That, that was the kind of, and I'll have more questions later. 
So uh, council questions before we go to the public? Anything about the uh, council member, Dan? Thank you. I have several questions actually, um, and I'll try to right. keep them short if I can. Uh, so um, I just wanna make sure that I'm clear on this. That the first year it's implemented, there would be a $125,000 startup plus the 400 for that first year implementation. So to start this up, it would be a $525,000 uh, program, I assume, for the first year. And then after the second year, it would be 400. Is that, is that what we're looking at? You're looking at, at an ideal implementation that it would just take uh, uh, one year. So, so what we learned from the uh, experience from other cities is that there is a setup cost where basically um, uh, you have to go ahead and, and fund the initial work, staff work, etc. That cost point is something like $100,000 uh, that, that uh, we are estimating right now. And then uh, once you have started the rental registry, it will take probably a year to one and a half years to up to two years that you have actually it populated so that uh, that's when you then start collecting funds and and so it's it's not like that you say it's, oh, it's uh, five hundred thousand. and if i may just throw another information in uh, to the best of my knowledge the rental units uh it just include uh rental units on the market and not in the closed market by the military so so those military housing units are not included in those numbers okay so um, then if I can follow up on that question. So what I'm hearing is the 125 startup is actually uh, 12 to 18 months uh, before you can even put the registry in place. When Then when you put the registry in place, then it's 400K per year then to run the, the program. Or um, I would think that if, if you're doing a startup of 120,000, 25,000, you're gonna have to hire the, the employees you're going to have to uh, get the software. You're going to have to do all that, which is four hundred thousand. From what I'm thinking, what staff is telling me, is am I right on that or no? Well, I think our one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars was divided between twenty-five thousand for building the registration software, for buying that rather from the vendor, and then the hundred thousand dollars was in staff time uh, to verify the number of apartments within the city and you know any other charges that go into getting the database up and going once you start the database uh, that is when people would start paying their fee and so you would see that program income accumulating as the fee as the program starts so you know if you had full compliance in year one you'd have that hundred four hundred thousand dollars if you had partial compliance you'd have less than that um, if there are more units than we estimate then you could have a higher revenue point um, for, that makes sense. I, I understand now. So um, would the rental registry replace the business license policy? Uh, the business collecting business no, license? No, no, it will not, uh, because you still have to have a, a business license. Uh, so the rental registry is in addition to the existing business license requirements. Well, I, I thank the staff for coming back with some information on the business license, because I think the last time we talked about this, there were some people that didn't even know we had a business license for for uh, apartments. So I'm glad that we brought that up. But I do have a question about, um, I, and I understand the data is limited to only 10 units and above. Uh, do other cities collect business license for less than 10 units? Um, say three units, two units, five units? Uh, do they do that or, or is that by state? Is there an ordinance that says we can only collect under uh, over uh, 10 units? Uh, I, I would be surprised if anyone of us knows the answer to that right now. So we, we, we don't know that. Our our ordinance requires 10 units and more. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if other cities have different numbers. I, I, I get, but again, it's I, it's a it's a it's an, a voter approved tax. So if you want to change that, you have to go to the voters and um, have the voters then decide. So business license tax again is a tax. It's a voter approved tax. We can look at that, but it would require uh, definitely also um, a, a voter approval for uh, the change in taxation. So to lower from 10 to two or three units, then we, that would have to go to the voters then? Yes, yeah. Okay, well Again, that answers, there you go, that answers my question. Yeah. That answers it's my question. It's not a fee. I, I get it, I yeah. get it now. I, um, that, that makes 
that answers a lot of I can just cross off five five questions there. Thank you, thank you very much, Hans. So um, I just have two more questions, and thank you, Council, for letting me answer these or ask these questions. On page seven, it says it, it is clear from the review of the uh, of, uh, available data that uh, considerable research, estimated twelve to eighteen months, would be needed to determine uh, more accurate figures. Uh, sorry. Anyway, pr pr prior to starting uh, the registry, um, so on and so on, um, would we have to hire a consultant firm or software to, to hire the staff to accomplish this test? Because in it, it says uh, this would be a, a substantial work uh, effort to conduct site visits uh, in each apartment complex. But the, where it, where I, the point I'm trying to make is prior to starting the registry, does, does that mean that um, we have to decide on a registry first before we do that? Or um, if we decide uh, in the next three or four weeks, we're gonna do a registry, then we get going on it. Uh, is that what I'm hearing? Yes, yes, that's what I'm, well, Alan answered my question because Alan went like this, so I'm wondering. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so explain, um, I, I guess what I'm asking is on page seven, can you explain that paragraph to me? Because I'm a little confused on it. Um, yeah, so it goes back to not having a complete picture of the rental market and needing to verify the data we have from the county and the city. Right. Um, and so that would be potentially consultants that we hire. Uh, potentially as part of our housing element update, we could factor that into the land use survey that we do. Or it could be city staff that's brought on to do that. It could be a future coordinator and an administrative assistant that's already factored in as new staff to do that work. Uh, but that work was anticipated to happen as part of building the registry. So that once it's approved and moved forward, then that's when that ball would start rolling. So when I read accurate figures for rental market in a potential a rental registry, a potential means that it's not sure whether we're going to do that unless the data comes back after 18 or 12 to 18 months that we need a registry. So that's Actually, that's my question. Is, I, is, let, let me try to say it differently. I, I think you wouldn't undertake the effort in creating um, an inventory without going into step two, which is then filling that data into the rental registry. So if, if you are making a decision uh, to go forward with the rental registry, uh, what we are saying is we, we need about 12 to 12 months to 18 months to um, set up the software, which is a $25,000 setup fee. And then we have to go out into the field and verify all the data points. And that can be done as, as Grant was uh, saying with, with um, paid consultants or, or in-house staff but you wouldn't undertake that effort and then make a decision for yay or nay of rental registry because in essence, if you should say no, you, you have um, spent $125,000 on a futile effort, if, if I may call it that way. So um, uh, it's like what I always say in those points, you cannot go swimming without getting wet. And um, that, that's, that's a German <laughs> expression. But, but you, if you get wet, you, you will establish a rental registry. Okay, because in the past, um, when we decide on policies, it's always been our intent. And then once we do all the research, which that's what this sounds like is going to be done, then we make a decision on whether there's gonna be a registry. But I understand if we're going to do it and we're gonna put all this time in, then we all better agree that we're gonna do a registry. I get that. I have one more question, then I'm done. So. It looks like this is a big, a big part of this registry is a compliance piece, obviously. Uh, if we do have complaints, uh, who mediates those complaints? Does the staff have any idea where that would go? Well, it would depend on the type of complaint. Uh, you know, if it's a health and safety issue, mold or collapsing staircase, um, that goes to the city staff for code. If it's a lease dispute, uh, that's something we can or rely on Echo Fair Housing for. If it's a discrimination case, a fair housing case, that's Echo Fair Housing. Uh, but it really depends on the question. And as we all know from housing, there are any number of potential questions that come up 
uh, just when you own a home, let alone when you're renting a home as well. But Council Member Albert's question is is um, is, a, is a very good one. Uh, what are we doing if there is a, a legal issue? Uh, what the city attorney is not per se a renter's attorney. Uh, uh, it's the attorney. The city attorney is the attorney of the city council. Uh, so a question can be asked, uh, the, or the question that Council Member Albert is asking can say, well, should there be a legal uh, component added to a rental registry, uh, where basically we are adding um, a, a, a paralegal or somebody else expertise into the uh, into the mix, uh, and that person can then uh, help with the uh, potential. Um, uh, uh, compliance with rental uh, and, and housing laws. So um, uh, I think it's a it's a very fair and interesting question because right now uh, there is no provision in on, on the city side, uh, other than that we would hand over the uh, the rental dispute or the lease dispute to uh, a third party, which is Echo Housing. Uh, again, that's a question that 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 uh, I think uh, council might also consider to um, how how we want to deal with it. Do we want to add a component to to the housing office, and of course uh, the costs need to be recovered for that as well, or do we want to uh, using the word punt punt it over to Echo Housing? Okay, thank or somebody you. Somebody else. Thank somebody you, else. Hans. Thanks for answering my question, staff. I'm done. Well, for right now. Uh, we have other questions. Council Member Allen, then we'll go to Ed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I've got a couple questions. The first mm -hmm. question has to do with Section 8, um, housing vouchers. And Grant, um, sure. do you, does it seem to you possible that if we, like I'm assuming right now, do we know how many, how many landlords um, accept housing vouchers in the city? How many um, do accept, or how many might accept? Do we have any? Uh, do we know that? And is that something we could learn through a, a rental registry? It is something you could ask on a rental registry, I believe. But that could be a question: Is this tenant being, or is this unit being rented to a housing choice voucher? Uh, the Housing Authority for Monterey County is the agency that issues housing choice vouchers. So they can have, they probably do have already data on where those vouchers are. And um, you can no longer as a property owner, you know, discriminate against section or housing choice voucher. You can't say I'm not going to accept that. So uh, theoretically all units require, are required to take those vouchers. So we don't have the exact number. Uh, it might be something that's available from housing authority though. Yeah, thanks. It struck me that that could be a potential benefit to help low income renters in terms of being able to identify properties that maybe are more open than others to uh, accepting. Well, I know it's very difficult for our nonprofits to find landlords who will accept the vouchers once you get somebody a voucher. So second question had to do, I guess, with the license program. And this is something that was kind of new. Um, council, at least this council member didn't know about it before our last meeting. And I guess what I'm wondering is sort of the purpose of that program um, in the sense that normally we license businesses for purposes of ensuring that they meet regulatory um, expectations and laws and uh, monitoring compliance. But as you said, at least currently, the housing market is more or less a private affair. I don't I, I don't know what, whether we're really monitoring anything along those lines. So I guess I'm wondering what the purpose of the current license program is and how we spend that money. Do we spend that money on monitoring or regulating or providing rental um, services to, to, to tenants and landlords? Uh, every everyone uh, uh, who wants to do business in the city of Monterey, every enterprise uh, who is doing wants to conduct business in the city of Monterey is required to have a business license. 
And with respect to, to the housing uh, market, uh, a determination was made a while ago to put 10 uh, to put 10 units and more under the requirement of uh, business license tax. Uh, the business license tax uh, doesn't go into um, a, a special fund and then it's used to monitor the, the tobacco shops or the grocery stores or the souvenir shops. It goes into the general fund and it pays, uh, as, as it's a significant revenue source for, for the city of Monterey. And the business license tax, it goes uh, into the general fund and pays for general fund services uh, as, uh, as we or you, the council, allocate those funds. So it's not that we take a business license tax from Trader Joe's and use that to monitor Trader Joe's compliance with uh, the regulations that govern a, a, a grocery store. So it goes into a big pot. Uh, if you want to uh, make a determination that, that you say we want to allocate um, part of that discretionary funding that you have uh, into a non-discretionary funding by saying those funds that we collect from housing should go appropriately into uh, from um, uh, uh, business licenses for, for, for housing complexes, you can say that and that money can go then uh, out of the general fund and can be allocated for some of those expenses that, that you as council will decide. But for right now, we don't have that nexus. And, um, but that's, that's of course a uh, discretionary uh, item that you can select. Is that true? Is that true of all of our business license revenues? They all go into the general fund. None of them are earmarked to particular services to yes. businesses. Okay. Yes, they, thank you. And and I, I see our assistant city attorney has something to add. <laughs> thank you, Hans. I just wanted to add that um, the way our business license tax was adopted, it's purely for revenue generation purposes and it's not regulatory by any means. And it's not a special tax, it's just a general tax. So if we wanted to change those things, it likely would, as Hans mentioned, require another vote going out to the people. Thank you. And my last question um, has to do with really understanding the rental market. And um, we've heard kind of claims from certain rental folks in the rental advocate community that there are a few corporate um, property owners who are really directing or controlling the rental market that in a, in a sense, because they control so many units, they can raise prices and kind of really force pretty radical shifts in the rental market. Um, we don't know if that's true or not. I guess I'm wondering if the data provided by a rental registry would help us be able to understand whether or not there are um, certain property management companies that are really um, controlling the overall rental market in terms of driving up prices, for example. Is that something we might be able to learn whether that's true or not? And if it is true, who's kind of driving that? Well, uh, so the rental registry can gather a number of data points, including the name of the property management company, the name of the property owner, the amount of rent being charged for that unit. Uh, so you gather that data and you can see the trends. You can see you know, who's charging what. Uh, so yes, that would yield that data. Great, thank you. And those are all my questions. Thank you, Council Member Allen. Council Member Ed. Yeah, thank you. I want to roll back to a portion when uh, Dan was asking the question. I think one of the answers um, from Hans was having to do with uh, echo housing. I wanted to drill down on that a little bit and, and ask the question, but do we have a sense of, um, so Salinas was looking at the cause for them to move ahead with a rental registry and their, and their intent was for uh, code enforcement and public safety. But do we have a sense of how often that is the case in the city of Monterey? Uh, do we get a, a report from ECHO that talks to us about the number of problems resolved or disputes or the number of mitigations? Um, so I'd like to hear a little bit more about the, the role that ECHO housing plays and how we use them. 
So Echo Fair Housing provides counseling services to landlords and tenants. So if you're a tenant and you say, um, I'm not sure, my rent increase uh, was really steep this year, is that allowed? They can walk you through AB 1482 and then they can compare what your increase was to what's allowed by state law. And then you as the renter can go back to your landlord and say, hey, look, you've charged me too much. Um, if there's a dispute between a landlord and a tenant, ECHO can provide mediation services if both parties agree to it. Um, but ECHO is not a, a legal firm. They're not going to be involved in you know, directly acting as somebody's advocate. They're more of an information resource and if everybody's willing, mediation. Uh, ECHO does provide an annual report to us every year on how many cases they uh, work with and they also do uh, discrimination testing which is part of which is what is required for fair housing. So they actually have two people call a landlord and see if they get different treatment based on their name, voice, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So all that data is reported annually by ECHO. And um, I don't have the reports handy right now, uh, but it's, it's available, we can provide it. And if I can just provide one um, piece of clarification, because I think your question was, how many um, complaints do we get regarding building conditions? Um, so the fair housing issues are typically referred to ECHO and they, as Graham described, um, the general complaints usually about mold um, or any other housing condition typically come directly to our code compliance office. And I think we have, uh, we could get you the exact number in the past year, how many um, housing condition um, complaints we've received but I can say it's probably less than 24. I mean, it's less than a couple dozen on an annual basis, but we, we could get you real numbers if you're interested. Okay, thanks. And the follow-up to that is that it sounds as though with our code enforcement compliance reporting system, the network where we're readily accessible to the public, uh, we have the capacity to take care of generally speaking, the code enforcement and the public safety reports that we do get now? The ones we receive now, we do have enough capacity. If the number of complaints drastically increased, um, we would probably have to look at staffing for, you know, if, of, of our um, building department as well in order to go out and do those inspections and determine if there's violations. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, that's the only question I had now, but I think I'm going to have some more questions after we hear from the public. Yeah, I think so. It's uh, it's going to require a deeper conversation without question. <laughs> so, uh, Council Member Tyler. Thank you, Mayor. Questions, um, please. Yeah, so I'm wondering um, what, staff is th what staff's thoughts are regarding the fee structure that is currently in place, right, based off of gross receipts versus a model that we see in Salinas based off of number of units with this sliding scale. I'm just wondering if staff has additional thoughts in regards to what kind of model might work well for our situation if we move forward. Well, I think um, flat rate is certainly the easiest to apply. Everybody who has a unit would pay this amount. Uh, however, a sliding scale uh, could be more equitable. Someone who just has one or two rentals say the classic mom and pop who use it as a retirement income, uh, they would pay less than say a corporation that has a hundred units. So uh, that's policy decision and how you structure it. I think staff recommendation would be as long as it covers the expenditures and is revenue neutral, uh, then it would be uh, a good way to go. Thank you. And how would room rentals be affected by this policy? Well, you know, that's an excellent question. Um, and I spent several hours actually talking with the city of San Francisco. They're working through that problem right now. Uh, as they mentioned, they had a program that just covered traditional rent control units and now they've expanded it. And uh, they're dealing with people who, you know, rent a garage or a laundry room or part of a living room. And uh, the landlords are trying their best to comply, but they're not sure how to report those units. And it's something San Francisco hasn't figured out yet. Uh, so that's might be a major issue for us to consider, especially with the student population here who may, you know, split an apartment or have multiple people on a lease. So all that would have to be considered in how you structure it. Well, I appreciate your several hours on the phone with the San Francisco staff there on that one. Um, uh, 
you had spoke earlier about how the fees could be passed on to the renters. It's hard for me to imagine a way around that, but I'm just, I want to ask the question, is there a way that we can structure this where it can't be passed along to the renters? Well, you know, I think it's important to look at how this is written. This would be a city ordinance. Uh, that's how you establish a rental registry. And so that's really a legal question. And so we'd have to work with, you know, outside counsel who helped us in September to structure that ordinance and you know, see if there's a way that the fee isn't passed on. Uh, if it's a relatively minor fee, you know, $50 a year divided by 12 months, um, it's not a, a huge burden now to be passed on, but if it's a higher fee, uh, it could be burdensome to a renter. Um, and then my last question here is maybe a little bit rhetorical, and so it doesn't necessarily have to be answered, but I, I, pre I create the space for staff to provide a response if there's been much thought put into this, but I, I in, in the staff report, there, um, there was this identification, the need for us to do extensive public outreach, and I imagine that that focuses squarely in a large way on the renter community, and so I'm wondering what the thought process is in regards to what that public what that public outreach would look like, particularly to the renter community? Well, you know, I think it could take any number of formats. Um, the cannabis outreach is one format, you know, mailing postcards to people, having online forums, having in-person forums as COVID restrictions allow. Uh, City of Salinas had its own subcommittee, uh, so you could have a committee structure of members of the community that meet and review policy elements. Uh, I think our point in including it in the staff report is just that uh, we want to make sure the community is consulted on this because it is a significant new uh, new program. It's not like emergency rental assistance. It's responding to an emergency um, and you have to act quickly. Uh, this is a major new undertaking to last a long time, you know, affect over half of the population of the city. So. Okay. Thank you, Grant. Appreciate the, the response to the questions. Yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, Councilmember Tyler's uh, question raised one of my own. And in that, if there were a fee, how would we know if a uh, landlord passed that on or not? We we wouldn't know. They're just raise. I'm raising your rent fifty bucks a month. Why? Uh, well, <laughs> utilities, insurance. Yeah, I, that's something I, I think would be on the our ability. So. Again, maybe a rhetorical question for later, since uh, uh, Tyler asked one. Thank you. <laughs> and that is, so I'm listening to all this, reading all this, hearing what Salinas is doing, et cetera. So property maintenance and code compliance seems to be one thing that a rental registry accomplishes. As I'm reading the report, it doesn't provide affordability. It doesn't control rents. Basically, it does help to a small degree property maintenance and code compliance. Then I'm hearing that the number of complaints in the city is very, very small. Now, I understand that sometimes renters don't want to report things because they're afraid of retribution. And that's, that's a whole different subject that shouldn't be allowed anyway. So unless I'm missing something, basically this uh, program would provide for property maintenance and code compliance. So my question is, would that be above and beyond our capacity right now? And I heard our community development director saying, right now we can handle that. So I guess I'm asking the fundamental question, help me define the problem when you're talking about a program that's probably going to, come on, it's gonna run half a million a year, we know that. So am I missing anything here from, uh, um. As I think about it, I think it, you know, as we start new programs, how many new complaints are we going to get that is above, right. you know, approximately 20? That's really hard to predict. I mean, if we have 6,000 housing units registered, how many of those will we start getting? Because there's, um, you know, more transparency perhaps between the rental market and the government. Will we? How many more complaints will we receive? We'll have to monitor for, a year and then let you know if we need additional staff for you know what's normal in terms of a yearly number of complaints. Would we be able to get some of that information from the cities? Here, Grant, you're gonna have another several hour conversation with San Francisco. But uh, if you can find our comparable city to Monterey and figure out it, 
the number of complaints they get and has it increased uh, or decreased or stayed the same because of a rental registry, that would be really helpful and that would be empirical evidence. So I don't know if that's something we would be able to find out. You know, it's something we can inquire to those uh, 16 cities that were listed on the slide. Um, Santa Cruz is another local example. Uh, but as I said, all those cities are larger and larger yes. urban areas. And out of 460 some cities in the state, um, you know, less than 20 have a registry. Uh, in terms of a problem that this could be answering is that there's not a lot of information on the rental market now. So it's an unknown. And having new data could help you identify trends and maybe find problems you don't know that are existing. Say, uh, yep. people being evicted uh, before their lease is expired or something like that. So you could identify trends. And it may be that you don't identify any problems. Um, but at this point, we don't have the answers. Right. So, and, and a rental registry, I, does it look at the legality? Are these cities looking at the legality of leases? Do they review leases uh, and all that or not? Is it just a database? Well, uh, you know, if you ask them to upload your lease, you could have staff review 60, 600, 6,010 leases every year. Yep. Um, but <laughs> I'm not sure that would be a, a full good use of staff time. Got it. Okay, those are kind of the unknowns that we can discuss a little bit more when we get it back from the public. I, I would just add, Mr. Mayor, if I might, yes. uh, it would help us to um, communicate with us as well. We we have uh, uh, on online right now a bunch of folks that are renter advocates, and it would help us to get a feel for uh, what what is out there. Uh, we look at official numbers. We look at those that that we have here. Um, as you indicated, Mr. Mayor, there the might be a fear of, of uh, some of the renters to go public. Um, and I, I, again, I, I trust that the folks that are advocating uh, for, for the renters might have uh, more information than we have. And I would just say, let, let us know, encourage them to, to um, share with us some of those data points without um, uh, going into great details, but give us a feel for what 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 we have in our city as well going on, because we we just look at, at what we see as official cases. Yes, that's true. Oh, so ready to go to the public council? Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and, and get some of that uh, valuable public input that that we all cherish and listen to. So um, we'll turn it back to Clementine to. Uh, open up our um, public comment section, please. Sure. We've got Jean Rash, who's been patiently waiting. Uh, so, Jean. Thanks, Clementine. I'm wondering, with all this data, um, if there is there any city that intersects with um, developing an, an advertising tool that you could could sell um, and offset the cost. Is any city doing that, a, a parallel program where a rental becomes available and for a fee, the owner corporation could advertise on a parallel platform and we could get income from that. It, it's, a tiny bit similar to what Alan's talking about, if understanding the Section 8 housing market better and and um, paralleling these programs. And I, I thought his idea was a great one if we could understand that market better and, and expand it. Wouldn't that be great? Um, as far as it being a public nexus, um, Seems that something that affects 65% of our residents um, makes a lot of sense. And when I first came here, Hi. I was, um, you know, intrigued that the government was involved in the sports center and the government was involved in the conference center. And I'd never heard really of, of, of that. So it, when I look at it from afar, the nexus to being involved in the housing registry makes makes 
a lot more sense. Um, I've gotten used to our involvement in those other areas and the tourism impacts. But when I look at where the government would naturally be, to me, it would be naturally in a housing, in the housing sector that's affecting so many people here. And it, it, would, it will be interesting to watch and learn about that market um, and the pressures and the realities that are affecting so many of our people. So that, that's my comments, thank you. Thank you. And uh, next, let's hear from Eloise Shim. Eloise. Okay, um, I'm Eloise Shim. And um, I think the idea of a rental registry, can you hear me? Oh, okay. So um, I think it will decrease the idea that the rental registry will decrease tenant exploitation, in my view, is untenable. The reason that landlords are able to remain unaccountable cannot be remedied by a rental registry. Local agencies, whether they are code enforcers or legal entities, find loopholes in holding landlords accountable. There is a constant flux of housing options for all others than property owners, and those options are decreasing, not increasing. For landlords, and I hate to make a cliche, but might makes right, and renters are forced to pay for uninhabitable conditions, even if those conditions compromise their health. If you're sick, you cannot generate an income. It's doubtful that a rental registry will equalize the balance of power between tenants and landlords. The landlord will pass the expense to the tenants and will justify that the cost of doing business has increased because of the rental registry. Any grievances brought by tenants will in most cases be undermined. Um, for tenants, it will be another obstacle in finding housing when housing is already scarce. The Board of Supervisors recently approved of an agency to oversee short-term rentals in the county. Hopefully that that entity will free up rental stock, but adding another level of bureaucracy will make things more complex for rentals. And people need housing. They don't need another encumbrance to housing, which is what a rental registry will provide. Um, I have a question. Would who would have access to the rental registry database? Would it be the landlords, the tenants, or just the uh, staff in Monterey or everybody? Um, and somebody said something about the housing authority in section eight, and I just wanted to comment that the John Wizard from the city council in Seaside has found that the housing authority has been pretty dysfunctional for quite a long time. So um, anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you for letting me share about this. Thank you for speaking. And um, next we have Gabriella Schlesinger James. Please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me uh, here today. Uh, it was really interesting to listen to what uh, Grant had to say, and your questions were also very informative in terms of opening our eyes to uh, the possibility of this registry. Um, my opinion is that, you know, it's it's on the right track, but I'm surprised that it's a track that we've gotten on so late. Um, what I would hope is that the council would be more aware of the conditions that our renters are currently living in, um, whether that, you know, that I feel like that should have been a higher priority in terms of getting to know your constituents and getting to know their circumstances and what they need. Um, and in order and, and having to, to 
integrate a registry like this, which will cost, I heard, over half a million dollars in order to implement, um, seems a little bit frivolous in, in terms of the, the fact that we haven't seen very many results um, with information that, you, that is currently attained. Um, so while it would really benefit, I think, having the information at hand, I am very, very apprehensive to, um, to have to charge landlords who have note as a renter um, and as somebody who has been looking for a place to live recently, um, it's rent one bedroom, one bedroom apartments are absolutely unaffordable. And those are the one bedrooms that are owned by the uh, rental companies like, um, like, uh, you know, the ones, the, the local ones. So um, yeah, I mean, I don't trust charging the renting companies an, an additional fee that won't be handed out to the renters. And I think it's just going to be, you know, uh, between that and um, having information that's actually that, that the, the council actually does something with is something that I'm not confident in. And until we see results with the information that we do have, because we do have plenty of information, information that is easily attainable um, just by interacting with your constituents, I think that I would um, vote to hold off uh, spending even more money on this. Uh, so thank you for your time and I hope to uh, see some results in the future. All right, thank you for your comments. And next we have Robert Evans. Robert Evans, please unmute and go ahead. Okay, I just have a question. Uh, the uh, state is, or new regulations really promote the idea of ADUs. And so how would they fold into this program um, is as if one were to develop an ADU, would they be required to come and get registered once the registry is there? Um, how is, anyway, it's, it, it seems to me that it's a little vague at this point, how you're gonna find uh, or include new rental properties as opposed to existing rental properties. And it, the, the, the program does sound expensive, but I think the data would be worth the effort uh, since we don't have that kind of data today. And so you really don't know what's going on in the market. Thanks. Thank you. And next, we've got a phone caller with the last three digits, 204. Please unmute and go ahead. You'll need to dial um, star, let's see, star six to unmute yourself. Phone caller, last three digits, 204, star six to unmute yourself, please. Go ahead, please. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Tom Raleigh calling from uh, Fisherman's Flats. I'm not representing what our neighborhood association uh, feels on this issue, but I just want to reflect uh, in my own case, my wife and I, we first moved here when I was assigned to the Naval Postgraduate School in 1968. And we found a single family rental house. We had, I think, four houses to choose from at that time. And um, we rented there until I graduated from school and got orders to Vietnam. They said, congratulations, you just spent two and a half years studying oceanography. You're going to be an advisor in Vietnam. So my wife and I uh, bought a house on Dry Creek Road and um, in Toyon Heights, which uh, at that time, Skyline Forest, the streets were in, but there were, were, wasn't any housing. So we were on the very last street in Toyon Heights. and. Um, my wife lived there for the year I was in Vietnam until I got back in February 72. And then we rented the house while I got orders to a ship in Alameda, California. Um, because of shortage of housing there, we wound up buying a condo. So anyway, we wound up having two. So eventually, um, after six years, and I was stationed in Hawaii on shore duty, we wound up selling the house here in Monterey. And then, of course, six years later, Five years later, we wound up moving back here when I retired from the Navy. 
I just give this as an example of the movement of renters into owners. And I don't think I'm unique. Um, we wound up buying a house in the same neighborhood that we rented in for two and a half years, Fisherman's Flats, because we liked the neighborhood. So the thing is, um, having been involved with the city, uh, trying to get housing programs, affordable housing, I've worked, I got a um, license as a realtor in 1988, and I've been involved in various programs. There are no silver bullets. There is no magic bullet that's going to solve all these problems. The um, owners that are renting uh, that are renting on an individual basis are going to resist registering. There are privacy issues that people are going to object to. Uh, you can try to put enforcement. You're going to need a huge enforcement staff to have anything work. When I think about what we went through, the neighborhood associations, 25 years ago to try and get a code enforcement officer for the city, and we still don't have a decent code enforcement officer for the city. I, last I checked, the last one was laid off or he quit or whatever it is. So the thing is, there's a bureaucracy that you're talking about creating, um, and it has to be a bureaucracy that's foolproof. So I guess what I'm saying is before you spend a half a million dollars, I think you really need to look at not San Francisco, need to look at uh, Santa Cruz, need to look at what Salinas um, does for a year, whether it works or not, um, we and need then to, see we how need it to goes before you adopt anything. Sorry, just to be fair Thank to you. all the other callers. And I uh, don't see any further hands raised, Mr. Mayor. Oh, two hands went up. Aha, uh -huh. you shouldn't have said anything. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> we're glad that they joined us. All right, let's hear from Esther Malkin. Hi, everybody. Um, so first, I want to thank the staff. This was a really good report. Um, um, I wish we didn't have to have waited so long and pushed so hard to get it, but they really covered a lot of info that we needed. I want to remind the council that one of the reasons why this conversation is having is because when advocates came to you and told you that there were self evictions going on and all kinds of violations to, to AB 1482 and different things. We got pushback saying, well, we never hear about this. We don't, we're not, we have no data proving what you're telling us. So, you know, we, this is one of the reasons why this came up. And so uh, in addition to that, I want to remind you all that it, it states in the report how old the buildings are in this city. 87% of them have been built before 19, 90, I think it said, I don't, I'm not sure. But the point is, is AB 1482 is flooded with exemptions. So anybody who thinks that. that's gonna be enough um, and that we don't need more, it, this isn't covering the majority of the 66% renters that are now um, the majority of the, the residents of the city that we should be con concerned with their health and welfare. And prevent them from becoming homeless because we can't build fast enough. And there's a direct correlation between homelessness and high, high rents. People can't afford rents. They go rent a room. They can't afford renting a room. They end up leaving, living on the street, living in their cars. So there's a direct correlation there. Um, as far as the scare tactic that is common of saying the cost is gonna be passed along to renters, if the $66 a year mentioned earlier by grants, or even $100 a year, is divided by 12 months, guaranteed that the, the property management companies have already created all kinds of new fees to, to, to get over the 10% annual maximum, that amount of money is just a scare tactic to use on renters. They are getting rent increases of $500 at a time. So 10 bucks a month is not gonna make or break them. It's just a scare tactic. And I wanna to refer to um, the, the comment that was made that we're, we have these business licenses because if you're doing business in Monterey, you need to, to know what's going on. Anybody who is making money renting is essentially a business. And as far as um, the, the one existing 
one that has 10 units or more being considered a business. I want to point out, no disrespect, but Dan Albert was the only one that knew about that. And there's a reason for that because he's got a vested interest. And this council, the majority of you are property, rental property owners. Okay, Esther, I need to cut you off. We need to stick with the three minutes. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Scott Dick. Good evening, everybody. You hear me okay. All right, so I don't know the evidence. I haven't seen any evidence that of multiple exclusions in 1482. Uh, the exclusions actually uh, are few. Uh, sitting in uh, evictions court every Monday for the last four years, they're few, especially with the added, you know, those ex ex exemptions are going to end pretty soon because of COVID. But let me just get to a couple points. Uh, I've been on the tactical uh, advisory committee at Salinas for four years. And the story they told Grant is not quite accurate. Their outreach has been limited and it hasn't been to property managers. When I met with the Salinas City uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce, many property owner managers and owners had no idea. So that's number one. Uh, the number two, you know, some people look at rental registries as anti-business and um, anti-property rights. And, you know, as a property owner myself with two units in Monterey, it's uh, we take all the risks. Uh, nobody back supports my wife and I with financial support if something goes awry. Most of our tenants are great and honest people every once in a while, like that people that did $60,000 worth of damage to our house. Hey, they got away pretty much scot free. So, you know, we absorb all the risk. And the original Salinas model was a total revenue generator, it was absolutely about generating revenue. Then they tried to sugarcoat it by saying it was about code enforcement. Then when we asked them, let's say that you find a scofflaw who is letting um, people live in a shed, a garden shed in a garage, and you red tag them, what are you gonna do with those people? And the code enforcer said, well, we're not about shutting these units down. So there's a lot more to the Salinas story. Monterey is not Salinas, and Monterey is not uh, Richmond or uh, San Francisco. Let me tell you a story about San, uh, Richmond. So they've gone so far from rental registry. It's kind of a slippery slope. I get it. But uh, an Air Force family who took a one-year assignment to D.C., rented out their house in Richmond. You can look this up because that family just lost the case that the PLF sued the city of Richmond. It cost them after one year to move back into the property $8,000. Those are relocation fees that Richmond thought were appropriate uh, to impose on that family, even though those people that moved into that house for a year knew it was part of the lease, part of the contract that they'd have to leave out a year. And that family was basically um, cost them $8,000. And it's a military family. They're not some corporate owners that had one house and they took that, that temporary job in DC. So let's talk more about this and maybe have an, a, a technical advisor committee so we can really work out these kinks because Selena's uh, is using that money uh, to generate uh, more people in their housing element. And we could talk about that at your leisure. I'm willing to meet with everybody. Thank you so much for the time. All right, thank you. And next, Barbara Meister. Good afternoon, um, Mayor Roberson and City Council members. I'm Barbara Meister. I'm the Public Affairs Director for the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And I don't, this, this idea of a rental registry is a new topic for me. I don't necessarily have a position on it per se, but I did just want to uh, join the conversation today for two reasons. One, uh, first of all, just to thank you for taking up this topic for uh, beginning the conversation about what can be done uh, within your power to influence the, the rental market as it is. Uh, secondly, just to reiterate, and it's become even more uh, pressing on us as an employer, as we have been trying to build back our, our team uh, through hiring, uh, and I speak somewhat for my other colleagues in the hospitality industry, uh, many whom were even reducing the amount of rooms available for, um, for sale to the tourists because of the lack of, of staff, so labor. Uh, was constricting the actual production of 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 rooms for for um, for visitors to come, and so what by what I'm saying is the constraint on 
are the incredible increases in rent has constrained the workforce ability to come here and work here. Um, but even then, uh, it's hardly enough for a worker to be able to um, just work one job on that salary and to be able to afford the rent. So it is a problem, not just for the renter per se, but it has this uh, systemic ripple effects uh, throughout the economy. And it's particularly distressing when you think about that pressure on the tenant a renter as a worker is, is limiting the labor force and therefore limiting our ability for our restaurants, hotels, businesses to, to um, be thriving economically. It's constraining their economic uh, opportunity. And then that in turn constrains you know, our overall revenues as, as a, uh, a destination and as a local tourism economy. So just sharing that insight as an employer. And again, I thank you for wrestling with this question and I look forward to learning more about it and engaging with you as you go forward. Thanks again. All right, thank you very much, Barbara. And next we have a telephone caller with the last three digits, 018. Telephone caller 018, please dial star nine to unmute yourself. Oh, they lowered their hand. Okay, um, next I will go to a telephone caller with the last three digits, 713. Please dial star nine to unmute yourself. Telephone caller with the last three digits, 713. Go ahead. Uh, hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi, my name is Jeff Davy. I'm a lifelong resident of the Monterey Peninsula. Thank you to the city council and mayor for having this uh, uh, meeting today and discussing this item. This has been discussed before and um, I just want to caution the city council on taking steps to establish this registry before it really realizes or has a plan in place of what it wants to do, especially when we don't know if we're talking about court enforcement issues or if we're talking about uh, uh, the way renters are treated or if we're really talking about getting a control of rental rates, which I really think that's what's driving most of this. And if I'm wrong, I apologize. But uh, obviously, the last uh, well, the last 30 years, what's happened in our real estate uh, market and in pricing, and in general, a failure on our entire state, but specifically a failure locally to build and provide housing in our community, much needed housing, has resulted in the supply problem that we have. And the supply problem has created this mess. It's not a simple fix. There's no reason to uh, create such a registry and have these fees and charge these individuals and collect this money if we're not going to do something helpful with it and if it's not going to be effective at the goal. I, I don't see the goal. I don't see what exactly you're trying to solve. If you want to institute more restrictive rent control in the city of Monterey, beyond 1482, then just have meetings about that. Um, I know a lot of information is available from the public. Uh, the uh, title companies have ownership information. The idea that there's some corporate owners of property controlling rents and rising rents is absurd because I know that doesn't exist. You can find out who owns property. It's public record. And you can see how many properties they own. And if they are large companies from out of town, controlling the market. You can see that. Uh, there are a lot of property management companies in the community. I'm one of them. There aren't very many that have a lot of properties under their management, but there are a handful, and it's easy to identify them. I was not phone called about anything related to this registry. I provided information from the last meeting to the city council to help them re talk to uh, Chicago Title about data, but there was no discussion with my property management company about the issues that have come up in this meeting, like $500 rent increases or um, fees being created just to uh, somehow get around the current rent control measures. I mean, as a resident of this community and a lifelong community member, I care about it as much as everybody else. And I don't want to take advantage of anybody. And I don't want to hurt tenants. I want to help them as well. 
but we need to make sure we're doing something that's going to solve this problem. And if we're trying to mask all of this in the interest of rent control, then just go ahead and let's Jeff, talk about that. Jeff, we need to have you finish your comment. Thank you. Okay, and thank you. And the last caller is 018 again. And I realize I apologize. I said star nine when it's star six to unmute. So please go ahead. Star six and then go ahead. Okay, okay. I'm unmuted. I think. You got Hello? it. Thank you. Um, yep. Okay. This is Lori Hambaro. And I just wanted to make a few comments. I want to think maybe we should be taking more of a regional approach instead of trying to do it on our own. We have Pacific Grove, we have Seaside, Carmel. I don't know if Carmel would be interested. And so that might be helpful in this large expenditure to create this registration. And then I'd also like to make mention, my mother used to own property in Pacific Grove. It was a three unit property. She was required to have a business license. For that business license, the City of Pacific Grove inspected her building to make sure that it had the uh, fire extinguisher that I need that it needed as a multifamily building, and that was about all they did. And then, I think we need to up our game with Echo Housing uh and advertise their services more so they can mediate these large rental increases because there is a state law that does at this point control control rent so that's all i have to say thank you very much for listening bye <laughs> thank you Lori. and i don't see any further hands raised at this time mr mayor all right I was unmuted, then I muted myself. My <laughs> my little rat terrier is a little restless tonight, so I try to keep her input to a minimum. All right, well, uh, as always, we enjoy the public comment. There were two or three questions that were raised during public comment. I'm sure our staff wrote them down, but I heard uh, who has access, if, if there is data collected, who has access to it? Is it public record? Yeah, so the data is um, not just published on a website. Um, so uh, it is can be distributed in the form of say an annual report on how the rental registry is doing, aggregate data, not um, any personally identifiable data. As one caller commented though, uh, property ownership is public record. So if you want to know who owns an apartment complex, uh, that's easy enough to find out if you want to go down to the county or do a title search. But the rental registry data is uh, is the city data, and Kim and I actually had a wonderful demonstration from the company that gave us the quote, and they walked us through what some of that data looks like. And um, that's just for city staff to review, other than the aggregated um, annual reports. In, in all likelihood, yeah, I, I have uh, Karen uh, answer that question because there's a there's a distinction in Grant's answer, and Karen can can share that, please. Yeah. So. We might have a database that could be city um, property, for lack of a better word, but um, the data, you know, putting out reports, that type of information that would be public. But, you know, the names of tenants, their contact information, things like that would all be redacted and not provided in response to a Public Records Act request. So hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, and secondly, uh, our friend Bob Evans asked, would AD, well, again, I, that would be how the registry was designed, but would ADUs uh, be subject to the registry and a fee also? Yes, if the ADUs were included. Um, so again, that's how the program structured. But if you wanted to say all rentals or ADU rentals, then they would be included. Okay, then. Uh, one of the public said, well, people may be reluctant to register. If they don't register their rental unit, what happens? Well, that goes to the question of monitoring it. And if a tenant reports that this inquires, is this unit registered? And it's not, then that would be staff time to go out and follow up with the owner for why they haven't complied with the ordinance. Right. And just and following that, again, that to the next step, um, Karen, I don't know if you have any comments 
if they refuse to register, even they would be in violation of a city ordinance. I don't know what our remedy would be. Um, would it be fines or would it be legal action or to be researched? Well, a lot of that could be a policy decision in terms of when the ordinance is adopted. Does council want, you know, a notice of violation to be sent to the property owner initially and then followed up with a fine schedule. Those are all policy decisions that could be laid out in an ordinance. Exactly, right. Did Were there any other questions that I missed? Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I just may, uh, in response to Tom Raleigh, just state that we have a code compliance coordinator, and I sincerely believe he is decent. Um, that Tom indicated not a decent one. So um, one of my jobs is to to talk about staff and defend it. So yes, we have a code compliance coordinator. We had one previously as well, and uh, the one who's doing the job, by all means, is very decent. Thank you for that clarification. That's important to know. Okay, so you know, I, when this subject was first brought up, I, I was very open to the concept, and 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 one of the questions that I wanted that that basically I asked myself, what what would be the goal? What are we trying to accomplish with a rental registry? So everything that I've heard from our staff, com, com, comparable cities, and the public input is property maintenance and code compliance, public safety. As I read the report, it doesn't lead to affordability. So my question is, and kind of where I would be going, is ask our staff to take a look. Do we have enough code compliance? Do we have enough uh, property maintenance overview? And are we uh, getting the complaints that we think we should? Seems to me that's what a rental registry is after. And I'm thinking if that's the goal, and I haven't heard anything differently, if that is the goal, and then uh, I think there may be another way to accomplish that goal besides creating a half a million dollar bureaucracy. I think a fora, well, fora is only going to be around for five or 10 years, and it had specific things it was going to accomplish. And <clears throat> well, once you establish a program, a bureaucracy, they're hard to get rid of. Secondly, I'm thinking of the water authority. And there were millions of dollars spent on the water authority. And frankly, uh, very little came out of that. So my, my inclination would be rather than create a database that, that was going to require a half a million every year to keep up, I would focus on the problem. Somebody, a city manager years ago told me, I, I like to come in with solutions. And he said, well, are you, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Uh, yeah, good point. So if I'm hearing the problem is property management and code and uh, compliance and public safety, and that's what a registry accomplishes, I'm thinking there may be a better way to do that than spending a half a million dollars. Let's really focus on the problem and see if there are problems of problem properties rather than registering 6,000 properties when the problem may be 10, 5, 1%. So that's where I'm leaning. Let's uh, ask our staff. I would ask them to come back and look at the problem more specifically rather than say, yeah, we're just going to do a rental registry. If we end up there and that's the way to solve the problem, fine. I'm not against that, but I haven't heard anything that tells me that's the way to solve the problem of property maintenance and code enforcement. So that's where I'm coming from, and I'd love to hear from my esteemed colleagues. Uh, Council Member Allen? Oh uh, yeah. So um, I think I have kind of three thoughts I want to share. First, in response to the question of whether or not the rental market is something a city government should be involved in or should monitor or um, be concerned about. I think Barbara Meister and Jean Rash together answered that question pretty clearly, at least for me. Um, Jean talked about the fact that we have two thirds of our residents who are affected uh, and are involved in the, the rental market and nothing probably affects their quality of life more 
um, then the cost of living and the major cost of living driver is rent for them. So quality of life is one of our driving um, one of our driving factors in in our, in our city mission and vision. And so I think that um, there's a case to be made for it from that point of view. And then I think Barbara Meister made kind of the other side of the case, which is the effect that the expensive housing market is having on businesses and our ability to basically staff a workforce. So I think both of those things are true. Um, so I do think that this is something that is worthy of our time and is appropriate to, to city government. Um, the second thing here, I'm really kind of responding to Jeff Davi and I really appreciated his kind of directness and honesty when he said, you know, and, and I think Mr. Mayor, you were speaking to this. I don't think the driving force here is really about, about um, code enforcement. It's about the exploding cost of rent and the effect on the cost of living of people and how that is creating so many other ripple effect issues. That's how this got started. And I think we as a council were maybe a little uncomfortable looking at rent stabilization. And we thought, well, maybe this, maybe we just don't understand it enough. So we need more data. So we don't even know, some of us didn't know there was a problem. So that's kind of how we got into this. Um, I do think it's always good to have data. And I think there's a lot of data we, we would benefit from having. Like you, I'm not sure that it's worth $500,000. And here I kind of wonder if in fact, it wouldn't be more cost effective to kind of just expand our business license program to include a data collection element. We're already collecting a fee from business, from, from um, the larger land, uh, the property owners. I don't know why we couldn't ask them to fill out a form that indicates the rent that people are paying, for example, um, or how much they've raised the rent or what fees they're charging that kind of thing. I don't see why you would need to create a whole bureaucracy of that costs $500,000. It seems to me that we're maybe making it a little more complicated than we have to, and a little more expensive imagining what the program might be. That's just me, and maybe if we looked at this more, we could come up with a more cost-effective model, just kind of building on what we're already doing um, and maybe expanding it to not just 10 units, but maybe five units or something like that. Um, and uh, so, but then I'm gonna come back to my last point, which is a, which getting back to Jeff Dobby's point, maybe we really should refocus our attention on rent stabilization and what we can do to really better, um, to, to make rents more affordable in the city of Monterey. That I think is the problem. If you're asking what the problem is, that's the problem. Um, I'm not 100% convinced this is gonna solve the problem. I don't know if a rental registry could help. I think it might. Uh, definitely isn't worth 500,000 from my point of view. So um, that's where I'm at. I would like to maybe redirect our conversation to rent stabilization and, and kind of go back to that and see, revisit it, see if staff have ideas at another um, meeting on how we could look at that. And then possibly if we if we do want to do this, we would look at expanding the business license and maybe just include a survey form that would be filled out. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Alan. You know, when you were speaking, it, it brought to mind um, the reason I was almost late to this meeting was I, I took my uh, grandson and a friend of his out to uh, Marina after school, high school students. So lucky me, I get to interact with my grandson. And one of them is I'm driving by Sea Haven and Marina and it's urban sprawl, no offense, urban sprawl at its best starting at a million dollars. Uh, one of the campaign issues uh, in 1985, when I ran uh, for mayor uh, to get reelected, uh, was affordable housing, believe it or not. And 
Fort Ord was identified as one of the areas of potential affordable housing. And isn't it interesting that it certainly isn't playing out that way? But then I see other models, the city of Monterey with uh, one of the keys to affordable housing is uh, free land and the city has four projects going forth. And so when I heard my good friend, uh, Barbara Meister talking, uh, the city historically has encouraged um, major companies, major property owners to help provide housing for their workers, a model that um, CSUMB has done, uh, UC Santa Cruz, it's being done all over the place. And yet I haven't seen people stepping up yet. I would really encourage folks who have uh, an essential workforce to help them build some housing, help them find housing. It just can't be the open market and the city's trying to do its best. So sorry, I, I just had the, some thoughts on that. So. Yeah, but thank you for your, yeah. your comments, Dan, uh, Council Member Dan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I wanna thank the staff for, in the report, they actually put the uh, uh, one of our value drivers in. I, I asked them to do that in, yeah. in the reports and they did it, thank you. And so to repeat what they, they wrote, it said support efforts and policies that provide equitable access to affordable housing in Monterey in the region. I'm along with Alan and Jeff, not quite sure if this does what that value driver says it should do, um, the register itself. And if, if there is going, if we are going to focus on that driver, then we do need to look at rate, rent stabilization, uh, at least uh, whether it's, it, it'll work or not. Um, I'm, I'm not one, one to talk about it now, it's, it's not part of the subject, but, um, it is part of the, the value driver that, that we discussed. So I, I want to get back on the business license because um, along with Alan, um, as a staff, former staff member, the first thing I like to do is just try to find a solution either by um, compromise or try to find something that we already done that's not redundant. And that's why I brought up a business license and I was shot down by the staff tonight, but that's okay. I, I get it. <laughs> But 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 I, I agree that um, we already do have a, a, a system in place, um, and I do agree with Alan about looking at uh, minimizing uh, the minimum from ten units down to three or two or whatever, and maybe increase the fees. Because to me, it, you can collect the data through that system already. And and mm -hmm. but of course the the staff said, well, that will have to go to the the people as a vote. But I think we could probably look at maybe. Uh, other ways of, of working that out. So I'm hoping that uh, maybe we can do a little bit more in that in that area. Um, for me, collecting data on rental units uh, can be can be useful. It, to me, it is useful. But uh, as everybody said, I'm not sure if 525,000 startup and 400,000 a year is worth it. And the reason I bring that up is I'm not sure if rental data changes year. I mean greatly year after year after year. So um, the data that you collect now, just like the census data, I, I'm sure it doesn't change the next year or the next year, but yet um, the program would cost 400,000 to have it in effect. Um, so I'm not sure if the data itself will change much. So I'm not really sure why we would spend 400,000 for data that doesn't change. My other, my other problem with this is the mediation, mediating conflicts. That's a big concern for me because uh, I understand that, that there are conflicts when it comes to property owners and renters. Absolutely there are. How many? I'm not sure. Um, and, and I do agree, at least with the, the fact that some renters don't want to bring those conflicts up to their, their landlords because there would, be, there would be a problem with that. And I get that too. Uh, somewhere we have to put in some type of, of system that that can help that mediation. Uh, but I'm not sure the city should get involved in that mediation because um, if there's a commission that's created to handle those mediations, then uh, who would appeal to that commission? Would it be the council? I mean, that just really opens up a big door. But there is a problem, and, and I understand that. Um, the other, the last piece is that um, it, it just seems as I was reading it, uh, that this register, it, it, the intent is to find out which property owners, uh, uh, you know, 
where the complaints are, who's have, who has high rents, who's doing illegal evictions, can, can, can the condition of the property, which you talked about, or violation of SB 1482, and how many is that? How many, how many property owners are actually doing that? To me, what worries me is that policy could be seen as de divisive in our city, and, and that that's that worries me because I, I think the city has never been us against them mentality, and, and I'd hate to see it us against them mentality. So for me, uh, I, I would be very very concerned about this policy uh, dividing our community. And, and for me, I, I favor fairness and equity by all means, but I would hate to see our, our community divided by a policy itself. So for me, I, I, would, I would rather see our business license expanded uh, in that program uh, more than anything else. I, I just think this might be just too expensive. That's hey, it. Thank Thanks, you, Dan. Council Member Ed? Yeah, thank you very much for the comments uh, previously by everybody. Um, there's a lot here and a lot to unpack, but I wanna uh, focus through and go through some of my notes. Um, but tonight, what we're doing is it's a study session and we've received an excellent report and thank you very much staff and city manager and Grant for working through the numbers and presenting to us um, what our options may be. Uh, but tonight, it's just to give the staff some direction about what we what we would prefer. Um, but let me focus on what I prefer not to do so the message doesn't get lost. Um, I, I think it's not, I'm not convinced, nor is it a compelling argument with what I've heard tonight, uh, that it's worth creating a a new section of the city staff and hiring to fulfill a function at the cost that it would be. Um, I'm just going back for the last two or three years where we've been going through our budgets uh, in the process that we, we went to increase TOT because we declared an, a fiscal emergency. We raised the sales tax, we raised the TOT tax. Uh, we had to tax and um, find money to fix our roads through measure P and through measure S. Um, I won't give you a history lesson because you've all been there too. You shared this last two years. So you know that we had to, to lay off a whole bunch of folks in the city. Uh, we lost $32 million or maybe north of that over two budget years. So the thought of creating an initiative that has this price tag, uh, I just can't agree. Um, and maybe at some point in the future, I would always be open to say, if we've identified the problem and, the, and the, the best solution is to hire some help to do that, but um, certainly not at this time. I think there's a couple of things that just jump out at me. Um, one of them in the city staff report was talking about the cities that have a rental registry and there were uh, the cities listed here. And thank you very much for that data. Uh, 16 cities participate in California out of 483 um, cities in California. If I did my math right, that's about 3.3% of the cities in California have a rental registry. So maybe it's a new concept. Maybe these 16 are early to the game. Uh, Salinas is entering into it. Uh, but Monterey has always had a history of being very contemplative, cautious, watching, and trying to find the best practices to replicate. And I just think this is early in, um, and I don't think that there's compelling evidence to jump on the bandwagon and become 17th or the 18th city that does this at the cost of $500,000. I'm just gonna go through a couple of things um, and some of it's to respond back to our, cal our callers. Um, I wanna say that uh, we do know what our constituents are going through and we do know that the rents are high. This is not a surprise to us. I think we all have been aware of this for a long, long time. Related to our own personal stories, related to our children, our friends, our families, employees. So we, we get that. 
There's nobody saying that we don't understand what the plight of the renter is. Um, we got some stories that were related and I was listening to Tom Raleigh when he talked about when he arrived in Monterey and also I arrived in Monterey back from college and my rent was $125 in Sacramento and my rent was $295 when I arrived in Monterey. Monterey has always been a higher rent area and I arrived back here after college in 1976. Yes, I'm dating myself. Yes, I'm old, <laughs> but um, I just remember going up here how it was always a higher priced area, limited land, limited resources, high demand, uh, a place that a lot of people want to live. And yes, maybe salaries aren't what they should be, but we don't have a lot of high paying jobs and we don't have a very broad, diversified uh, workforce that maybe LA and the Bay Area does. But there's no silver bullet. And I don't think this registry uh, comes anywhere close to trying to solve uh, what our, uh, our problem is. Um, a, a big increase, um, or a big, I'm sorry, a big, a big reason to uh, be against short-term rentals for me when we go back to whether or not we wanted to go out to the voters and ask for short-term rentals was to continue keeping as many uh, homes and apartments and living spaces on the market for our workforce. So um, we talked a lot about Airbnbs and, and short-term rentals, and we have an ordinance that restricts that. And that's a good thing because that keeps as much of our housing stock on the market as possible. So we should, uh, we should be proud of that as a city. We're one of the only cities in this area that does that. Um, I don't want to put a financial burden on this city with an initiative like this, as I've already said, uh, for all the other reasons where we've been the last couple of years, it wouldn't be prudent uh, to dive into something else like this. Uh, another point that stood out for me is if a single family dwelling is exempt from um, AB 1482, why would we include a single family residence on a home? register. So I don't know the answer to that, but I guess the rental registry is wanting to find out what all of the inventory is. But it seems like the legislative intent carved out uh, 1482 for a particular reason. So single family dwellings are not included in that. So there, I think there's a reason that the assembly and the, and the state Senate did that. But I don't think um, we should we should include um, all residences in a rental registry if in some point or fashion in the future, we were to consider that. I think private residents should be excluded from that kind of thing. Um, let's see. I tried to number this so that it would work. I'm scattered all over the place with, with notes and I appreciate everybody calling and giving us information. Um, monitoring and compliance through an initiative like this, to me, seems like it's um, city government bureaucracy with mission creep. Um, Clyde, I, th I think you identified that when you started off with asking, well, what, what is the problem we're trying to solve? And the problem, I think, is that we want rents that are uh, affordable so our workforce can remain here. I mean, that's the problem. How do we get rents where they can be affordable and we don't lose our workforce. This doesn't provide that. Um, but having a city government um, take on another initiative to me seems like it's bureaucracy, it's worst and it's mission creep and it doesn't really solve a problem. Um, I, I'm gonna stop short there with one other comment. The comment about the registering or, or a business license uh, for the current number of 10. To me, I'd like to know back from the staff uh, if that's a vote that has to be done by the, uh, the residents, I'd be interested to have a conversation about that going forward to see what the merits would be to change that. I think that that's a funds that are being left that should be collected in the business enterprise so if there are uh, units short of 10, 
I think there should be a business license. I don't know what the number is, if it's three, if it's five, but it just seems like it's time to be contemporary with an ordinance and to come back with some choices with that and, and potentially change that number uh, to capture that revenue because we can use that revenue for our housing support that we do as we have uh, five, over 500 units that are inclusionary housing. The city of Monterey, before I got on this council, uh, was a leader in that, uh, a city that took that very aggressively. Um, our challenge is the resources of land and the lack of a solution for long-term sustainable water that drives the costs greater. And as we have looked at properties the city of Monterey has, and as we wanna partner with nonprofit build, builders uh, such as Midpen, we have been very willing to partner with them to get units built for inclusionary housing and very difficult to do that without long-term sustainable water. So to me, that seems like that's where the solution is, is sustainable water where we can see the private sector build and introduce more units. And I'm just struck with the Garden Road project. You're all aware of what happened. Water, state water resources said, no, we can't get the water we think we should get. So the meters can be put in. And that's 75 units that could be built that are now in a state of limbo because we are in a cease and desist because we don't have the water. So we are hamstrung with the problem. I think this doesn't um, solve it and this doesn't give us any more enlightenment. And there's no aha moments here that I've learned other than the fact that I think we should do something about uh, possibly capturing some revenue to assist us with our housing programs and doing that through um, the capture of business licenses. So I'm, I'm not uh, in favor of moving ahead with this. All right, thank you for your comments. Council Member Ed, Council Member Tyler. Well, we're gonna let you wrap it up since um, we're close to adjournment. We look forward to hearing from you, please. Yeah, so first I wanna uh, thank staff for all the work that went into this. Um, I, I know it took a while and, and it took longer than, than anticipated, but um, I, you know, we heard it from the public. I think some of my colleagues have mentioned it as well. It's, it's a well put, um, it's a report that's well put together. And, and I really appreciated being able to read through it and having a better sense of where we are on things. Um, I agree with, uh, I think a couple of my colleagues identified this not being a silver bullet. And I, I don't think that any policy is gonna be a silver bullet. So I think we have to be able to look at this saying, how can we try to move this conversation forward? How can we try to, within our power, uh, address some of the issues that are being identified from the renter community. Um, and, and Ed, you had mentioned um, that Monterey is a contemplative uh, city and that's kind of traditionally how we've done things. And, and I, I agree with that. I think that's a good thing to a certain extent, right? I think it's good for us to take our time and consider, but I also just would caution us in, in taking too long to move forward on action regarding the renter community because they're, they're long past waited for a policy to be implemented. And another comment that you had made was um, Monterey has always been um, high cost of living. And so all the more reason for us to do something, it's not like this is a new problem. This has been going on for a long time. And maybe because we've been so wait and see type of approach, it has put us in a position where there's been little action in regards to addressing issues that are being expressed from the renter community. Um, it seems like there's some concern regarding the, the purpose. And Alan spoke to this a little bit um, in regards to maybe there needing to be a refocus of the conversation around renters towards rent stabilization. And if, if that's the direction that we go in, then the data regarding the rental registry is gonna be very useful in determining what that looks like. If we don't have any data, what, how are we gonna set something, how are we gonna set a, a ceiling um, if we don't have the data to be able to help us make the determination and where to go there? 
So I think big level, it's all about data. And I think having more data to be able to make good quality contemplative decisions regarding the renter community, it is a good thing. And I don't see there being a burden on the city. I think that this is going to make the city more robust and make us more effective at being able to support our constituents. Um, it's not as if we're taking money from another source and putting it in this space. We are creating new fee structure that will support this initiative as opposed to creating an additional burden. So I, I, I hate for us to look at this in, in, in a light as if we're adding um, something that is going to be a drag on the city when I think if anything, it's gonna bolster us up. So let me just speak quickly to what I hear the purpose being. Something that we didn't talk to too much, but I think is critically important when we're talking about um, community health and safety is identifying rental units and ensuring that up-to-date contact information is available for police, fire, and code enforcement in the event of an emergency or to address code violations, if that's the extent to which we go to. Um, uh, helps the city develop and implement our housing element and provide more robust housing services, such as mediation assistance and locally relevant information regarding available resources and legislative updates. And I think that that's both for renters and landlords. I've had conversations with landlords leading up to this conversation today. And I think that there's also a space for us to provide sample lease agreements on our website, provide resource materials for, la for landlords so they can find a way of responding to certain situations that they may be going through. Sorry. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Um, and, then, and then the last thing is, um, and, and as this was expressed in um, the staff report, it allows us to assess our rental stock. So tracking allowable rent increases, monitor changes in tenancies and rents, collecting data on rent stabilized apartments should, they, should the city adopt rent stabilization. So again, I think that there's a lot of things here where to me, this is kind of low hanging fruit and it, it should allow us to move forward but I'm also reading the tea leaves, right? So I, I see what my colleagues are saying and it doesn't seem like there's very much of an appetite to move forward with this. If at the very least we can expand the business license process and look at what that might be, I'm open to that. But I think as many units as we can include as possible, right? Because if we're trying to collect data on renter, rentals in the city of Monterey that make up 65% of the city, what percentage of the community of renter community are we going to leave out if we leave off the one or two you know unit landlords so i think as much as possible for us to be inclusive of all rental units is going to be a good thing for us in regards to progressing this conversation forward and being able to help in any other conversation regarding um the renter community um you know we've seen from the staff report that Nearly a quarter of all units in the city are occupied by low and moderate income households. So Alan said it exactly. This is very much an issue of housing affordability. And, and I really do feel like this is helping us go in the right direction. Um, and according to the staff report, you know, they used three different sources of data, the city's building department, the GIS database, um, and then the Chicago Title Company and there doesn't seem to be any accurate data available to determine how many total units are being rented in the city of Monterey. So this, again, it's all about the data. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, this seems like a well worthy investment in order to push us in the right direction so that we can make better decisions as we move forward in the future. Um, I, I think, my hope is that there's a space for us to continue having this conversation and going out to the community and doing some community listening sessions and having a dialogue with them. And hopefully this can be something that helps spring some a space for us to get further input, particularly from the renter community. So I would love to see a space where we can have staff uh, have a very specific strategic plan in regards to communicating and receiving input from the renter community. Um, and again, uh, I'll, I'll end with um, 
at the very least, in the staff report, it had identified something close to like 50% of the, the, the complexes, um, rental complexes that should be paying the business license today in 2021 didn't pay it. And I wonder how much that's consistent with the last several years. And, and I, don't, I don't know how far going back that that would be a consistent measure, but seeing that 50% aren't in compliance, I think at the very least, we need to make sure that, that it's being enforced and that the ones that are required to pay it right now by city code are paying it. So um, I, I just hope the conversation doesn't die here. I, I hope that we can take leadership and uh, being clear with staff around what does it look like next steps are so that it just doesn't die because renters are listening, they're watching, and they're, 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 they've been patiently waiting for us to take action. So my hope is, is that there's some, there's some clarity tonight before we sign off in regards what next step look like. All right. Well, I'm, again, I, really a, an outstanding uh, conversation. I appreciate all the discussion. We're almost 15 minutes beyond uh, adjournment. I think uh, with all the comments that we've made tonight, I feel uh, that our staff has some things to work on. And so we all look forward to uh, further discussion on this topic. So, Mayor, Mayor, I would ask, does staff feel like they have clarity in regards to what next steps are? A good question, thank you. Um, not really. Uh, I, I, I will tell you what I understand is, um, uh, we, I understand from the council comments, you like us to look into business license tax and to what degree uh, we can uh, uh, retool the information that we have there right now to get some of the information. Council Member Smith spoke about maybe looking at what is, uh, what do other cities are doing with respect to business license tax? Is, is, is 10 still a good number? Is five a better number? Uh, so that, that would be something I can tell you right now. Um, we cannot require housing uh, complexes to say, give us all the data about the rental units you have. Um, that will definitely be illegal as part of the business license tax. Uh, they pay the business license tax and that's it then they comply so so let's let's talk clear language here but we can add a voluntary questionnaire and can say tell us more about your your type of things and we have an annual uh, snapshot of of housing units complexes five plus more three plus more whatever the voters finally approve to that other than that uh, I, I i just tell you i think council sounds like they are not ready to make a motion to implement a rental registry i have not heard that but uh council has weighed the pros and cons and for right now uh, i think the the next step that i understand is from from council member hafa and and maybe to a degree also from the mayor and uh council member albert and, and williamson uh, is to uh, uh, look uh, at further discussions of rent stabilization because uh, that that was a common theme by, by uh, all, including also Councilmember Smith, of course. So um, I think the rental registry for me is dead in the water uh, for right now. And uh, you want to come up back with an alternative uh, um, ideas about uh, finding uh, data sets, probably through the business license tax, uh, look at a, maybe changing the business license tax and come back to you with rent stabilization ideas. I think that's that's what I hear right now. Um, and if I made a mistake, uh, of course I'm, but, but that's oh, how I read the, the Oracle right now that you gave us. Yeah. Well, and there was probably one other topic and that was getting back to yeah. one of the primary goals of, uh, right. You, you've got it. And that's, uh, identify the, the, the problems out there that we're dealing with and do we need to beef up, yes. uh, maintenance and code compliance do we need to beef up that department and also to see if we can get some hard data on the number of complaints that we're dealing with out there and help that. us yeah and that that's so uh, i to me one of the major things we want to make sure everybody has a safe livable dwelling all right mr mayor may, may yes. mr. just a very brief comment just to give feedback back to hans uh, I don't think I used anything uh, akin to rent stabilization in some of my my thinking. 
So uh, that is a whole other topic and requires a, a whole lot more effort with more time. But I just want to highlight that we did rent stabilization to assist our workforce as we went through uh, COVID uh, to the tune of over a million dollars to assist them. So this council is not without compassion or without understanding uh, of our workplace or our, our workforce um, issues. So I, I just, I want to make sure there's no mixed signals there with what Ed Smith said, but I am not uh, uh, fundamentally in support of rent stabilization. To me, that is stepping out of my philosophy. So I just want to make sure that no one misunderstands what Ed Smith is representing. Um, I don't think it's government's uh, place to do that. And rent stabilization to me sounds like rent control. And I'm not in, in, in favor of rent control because I think fundamentally it actually works against the, the tenants and actually makes the problem worse. So I just want to get on the record for that. Okay. With that, I hope you've all enjoyed the uh, sunrise over Monterey uh, and on my screen. And <laughs> is that is that live tonight? No, no, that's that's morning. I do have a night shot. I'll show you that one some other time. Right. All right, everyone. As always, thank you, public. Thank you, staff. Thank you, city council, for another really outstanding discussion. And we will discuss this more. I can assure you, with open minds. So with that, we'll adjourn our meeting.